Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS University of London. And uh, thanks to everyone who's here for this uh, linguistics webinar. Our presenter is another British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, uh, Tim Bott, who's uh, currently working with the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, and has been working on the documentation of a language called Kusunda, which he'll be sharing with us uh, today. So Tim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for creating this presentation for us to get to interact with what you're doing. And we look forward to seeing what you have to share. Okay, um, thank you very much, Joey, for this um, introduction. Thank you also very much for organizing these webinars and organizing the webinar today, as well as for inviting me to a, give a um, short talk here. Um, I would like to share my screens with you. And if all works well, you can now see a um, PowerPoint starting screen. Um, so thank you very much again, Joey, and good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning to everyone um, present here, and um, thank you for attending. Um, my BA postdoc um, at SOAS is indeed evolving around the Kusunda language spoken in Nepal. Um, and I have made a small addition here to the title compared to the invitation that you may have seen earlier. Um, as far as we know at this moment, there is only one speaker of Kusunda left in the world. Um, based on all the available evidence from Nepal itself, there's only one lady who still speaks the language. Um, there are some unsubstantiated rumors that there may be um, a few more people who migrated as laborers to India. However, no one has been able to locate them and contact them. So we really don't know. And for all practical purposes, we must consider that there's only one speaker of Kusunda left in the world. Um, in this webinar, I would like to uh, address two main issues. The first one is the current ongoing efforts of the documentation and description of Kusunda. And the second one are um, the efforts for revitalization of Kusunda. And in order to give you a little bit of background, I'll first give an introduction to Kusunda and I'll also explain how I became involved with the Kusunda language and its speaker speakers at that time. Um, so here we have a map of Nepal and in the Western part of Nepal, there are several districts and between brackets, you can see some figures. These indicate the number of Kusunda, people who ethnically identify as Kusunda, um, according to Uday Raj Ali's 2017 publication. So it's a really um, low number of people. And you can see that if you connect these areas with some historical evidence of where Kusunda speakers were found, you kind of get an arch-shaped um, figure in the middle hills of Western Nepal. And this is the area where um, we can presume that Kusunda was spoken in the past. Um, and um, there are still some speakers at present. However, this limited distribution and this low number of speakers does not really mean that Kusunda was always such a uh, small group. Um, until recently, the Kusunda led a um, primarily nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle. This they uh, maintained until the mid 19th century. Um, sorry, the mid 20th century. And um, they lived in the forest, they moved from place to place, they did not have any permanent settlements. And like this um, model that Gianni Maya is constructing here, they would make um, small uh, lean-tos um, out of branches and um, uh, leaves. And they would, depending on the availability of forest resources, they would move from place to place. 
And while in the forest, the Kusunda depended on these forest resources. They collected mushrooms, fruits, berries, dug for tubers, root crops, um, uh, and other forest products. And the Kusunda men were also very apt in um, hunting, and they used this kind of um, bows with very long arrows to hunt um, animals, birds like jungle foal, um, hill partridge, um, caliche pheasant, but also animals like monitor lizards, civet cats, squirrels, basically any animal that would roost or live in trees and have claws or talons. And that is quite peculiar because they had a kind of a taboo on um, hunting hoofed animals, for example, barking deer or, um, or goral or wild boar. So they had a, a, a very limited range of animals that they would basically hunt. Um, the Kusunda also never really practiced agriculture and they never um, reared any domestic animals. And the Kusunda women developed a practice of mm, going to the nearby villages um, with the sedentary population with their forest produce and there exchange it for other products that they needed themselves at that moment. Um, uh, for example, food grains or salt or whatever. Um, in absence of forest produce, they also um, tended to have this habit of going for begging in villages for products. And because of their position, they were, they were kind of considered the kings of the forest. People would quite readily actually share some of their um, food grains with Kusunda people who came to ask for it. Um, there are several reasons for the um, uh, decline in the Kusunda population. As is common for hunter-gatherer societies, they were probably never really um, numerous uh, to start with. And every small band or family group of Kusunda um, would move from place to place. And um, they would marry within their own tribe, within the Kusunda, but not within their own clan. So it was kind of, um, com a kind of a, a necessary for different Kusunda bands to meet each other in order to find um, marriageable spouses. Um, during the Rana regime in Nepal, which lasted from 1846 to 1951, and especially the subsequent uh, Panchayat system of governance that lasted from 1960 to 1990, the official policies in Nepal very much promoted ideas such as ek raza ek des, ek bhasa ek des, one king, one dress, one um, language, one nation. Um, and within that, that, that national integration um, policy, there was very little um, room for ethnic and um, linguistic consciousness. At the same time, we can see that improved healthcare, sanitation and education resulted in population growth. And in order to feed that growing population, um, the agricultural area was expanded. And that often went at the expense of the forest resources. So the government realizing that there was increasing deforestation then instituted a kind of um, nationalization of forests in which local communities were more and more um, uh, told to no longer um, uh, use the forest, res forest resources without the government permission. And as a result, the Kusunda were more or less forced to move out of the forest, but they were not really given an alternative um, because they neither owned land or had the means to buy land, they were, were forced to move into villages and live there on the land owned by others and become sharecroppers or bonded laborers. And they lost their nomadic lifestyle. And because of that, they, the various Kusuna bands, the family groups could no longer um, meet each other. And there was an increasing lack of marriage partners. Um, as a result of that, the Kusunda people had very little option except for marrying outside of their tribe. So they would marry with Chetri, with Thakuri, with um, Magar, with Kham, or with any other ethnic group, but um, they could not marry with other Kusunda anymore. And as a result, they assimilated linguistically as well as culturally to um, other ethnic groups, other castes in Nepal. And as a result of that, fewer and fewer people learned Kusunda as their mother tongue, fewer and fewer people were able to speak the language. 
Um, a little bit about previous research and the history. The first mention of the Kusunda and their language, at least in the Western literature, was by Brian Houghton Hodgson, um, his publications in the mid 19th century. And he considered the Chepang and the Kusunda as the broken tribes of Nepal. And um, he already made a rather grim remark about the possible future of these two tribes. And unfortunately, this has basically become the reality for the Kusunda. Luckily, the Chepang are still in a better uh, position uh, as far as their cultural and linguistic heritage is concerned. Um, perhaps it was Robert Schaefer in his 1953 publication on East Himalayish and his 1954 publication on the um, ethnogeography of ancient India who first um, came up with the idea that Kusunda was maybe not related to any other language or language family in the world, but rather a language isolate. Um, in the late 1960s, Johann Reinhardt, who I think is also present here today, um, went on a search and made video and audio recordings of the Kusunda people, their language and their culture. And the linguistic um, description he wrote together with Suyo Shitoba, published in 1970, and uh, several of his ethnographic descriptions are basically the first detailed accounts of the Kusunda, their culture and their language. Um, and the recordings that he made are a very priceless snapshot of Kusunda language and Kusunda culture um, and life in the past. And this really illustrates the value of um, documenting languages and cultures by ethnographers and by linguists and making video recordings, making audio recordings, etc. And in his 1976 publication, Johann Reinhardt expressed the hope that someone would actually go back into Nepal and meet with Kusunda and do some more research on the Kusunda before they would become extinct completely. So in um, the early 1980s, Ross Koffli made an attempt to contact um, some Kusunda speakers. He met someone, that person was already quite ages, passed away, and that was before any proper description could be made. And the same basically happened during the, 19, the late 1980s when several Nepali researchers and academics met with elderly Kusunda people who still knew about their culture, who still spoke their language, but one by one they passed away before ever any proper description um, or could be made. Um, so more or less the idea came into being that Kusunda even though there were still Kusunda people, the Kusunda language and the Kusunda culture had um, disappeared. Since the beginning of the 21st century, several Nepali linguists have conducted research and published articles on Kusunda. And these researchers were able to identify several Kusunda who could still speak their language. And in 2004, David Waters, together with some of his um, Nepali counterparts, um, invited Gyani Maya, Kamala, and um, Prem Bahadur, and they were able to make recordings that resulted in the first grammatical description of Kusunda published in 2006. And in 2013, Mark Donahue and Vojtas Gautam published an article based on their work and their recordings together with Gyani Maya. So despite the fact that really until 2000, 2005, there were not many descriptions of Kusunda except some vocab vocabularies, um, there were a lot of people who tried to link Kusunda with other languages and language families to kind of disprove the, the Schaefer's assumption that Kusunda was a language isolate. And some of these theories have since then been rebuked. There have been some new theories, um, but at the moment there is not really any conclusive evidence about the genetic relationship of Kusunda, whether it is a language isolate, whether it is related to languages more closer nearby or further afield. Um, and like many linguists working on the Kusunda or, or in the Himalayas, I had heard about Kusunda, but um, I had um, presumed it to be extinct. Um, so I knew it was a language isolate, but I thought, okay, there's not much to do um, regarding Kusunda anymore. 
However, in September 2018, while I was in Nepal, I um, received a request from um, a colleague at the Max Planck Institute in Jena. And um, I think Meishin, she is also here. Welcome, Meishin. And thank you for introducing me to Kusunda. Without you, um, this would never have been possible. And um, I received a request to find a book which was recently published. And this is the book, Kusunda Tribe and Dictionary um, by Uday Raj Ale. And I managed to locate him via via. And through this, I managed to, um, he came to Kathmandu and there we met. And I was very much impressed by him as a community linguist. Um, he has been working on Taru language. He's been working on Kusunda and he has really done a lot of um, good work. He is very dedicated. He's very motivated. So that his, it was kind of a, um, how you say, um, uh, like a, a contagious disease, but then a good one. So he, he his 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 um, involvement with the Kusunda kind of jumped over to me, and especially when he started saying like, okay, the Kusunda people themselves, although there are not very many of them, and although there are not many speakers, they're really interested to have their language documented, described, and even revitalized to the extent that people will start speaking it again, and. Um, both his ent enthusiasm and, and his, um, uh, uh, the way he expressed the wish of the Kusunda people made me think like, okay, there has to be a way in which we can uh, work more towards this. And um, after some discussion, we found it important that we should um, make recordings of these last two Kusunda speakers that he was aware of. Um, and um, at, and in, through that documentation, um, contribute to the ability now or in the future to further describe the language. Um, we, Uday and I managed to obtain funds from um, several organizations as well as from um, very generous people through crowdfunding, which enabled us basically to kickstart this, this, this process, to kickstart um, our, our project to, to further document Kusunda. And then we then met in Kathmandu in Nepal in late July and early August 2019. So our recordings consist of elicitation sessions, monologues and conversations. Um, we basically have around 50 hours of audio recordings and 22 hours of video recordings. And out of these 50 and 22 hours, around 20, 20 hours are basically purely in the Kusunda language. There's a little bit of code switching with Nepali, but there is no uh, speaking in Nepali by me or by Uday or speaking in English. It's, it's basically in Kusunda. Um, elicitation, for example, of vocabulary or verbal paradigms was a fairly minor component of our approach. Um, we did record a word list on the request of the Max Planck Institute in Jena, and we did cross-check some of the verbal paradigms um, that Waters had earlier described. Um, but it was not the main purpose of our um, uh, recordings. And neither were monologues, although we did record them, we invited the speakers to talk about um, th themselves and their personal history, the history of the Kusunda, the mythology of the Kusunda, um, their few views on the Kusunda and their language and some of their personal experiences. So for example, Jenny Maya told us about how she and her mother used to go into the villages to beg for, um, for food grains. And um, no, sorry, Kamala was the one to tell us about the, the begging process in the villages. And Gani Maya told us about her life, um, nomadic life in the forest. And she told us about uh, medicinal plants, about the different stages of um, life in Kusunda culture. So from birth till death, etc. However, the primary objective of our recordings was very much conversations because these were, as far as we knew, and as far as we know now, the last two speakers of Kusunda. So we wanted them to interact, to convince each other, to argue with each other, to discuss with each other um, in order to get a, 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 a much wider repertoire of linguistic features. Um, we use different methods to encourage them to talk. For example, we asked them to talk about their shared experiences, their earlier visit to Kathmandu, for example. 
And we also showed them a video that Johan Reinhardt had made in the late 1960s and asked them to comment on it, what they saw. And another method that we used was um, existing materials. So we had two English storybooks, we had four Nepali storybooks, and we just asked them, what do you see? Just to describe the, the pictures that were there. And we realized that the frog story or the English um, children's book storybooks were a bit more difficult to relate to than, for example, this kind of pictures about typical Nepali household life, typical Nepali village life, in which they were really able to very, in a very engaged way, talk about it. Oh, this is this, this is this, no, it is this, and, and discuss about what they saw. Um, so we asked them to, to, to talk about, about these, these, these pictures, these images. And um, we, are, we are planning to use at a future moment also to ask those authors of these children's books, the publishers, whether we could maybe make a, a, another publication um, a reprint in which the Nepali is, is replaced by Kusunda written in, in the Devanagari script. So just to, um, to create a kind of a um, children's books for Kusunda children to, to learn their language. Um, we also want to explore other options such as, for example, Bloom community books. However, the main problem is that it's such a small community, it will be quite difficult to find um, the funding to, to, to um, publish these storybooks. All in all, we think that our um, recordings were quite a success and it was also very timely um, on hindsight. Um, in January 2020, humanity lost a great person, um, the second last speaker of Kusunda and a great repository of knowledge on the Kusunda culture, their nomadic life, um, the stages of life, um, the medicinal plants and many other aspects of the culture. And after a short illness, Yanimaya, whom you see pictured here, passed away and she was buried according to Kusunda customs. And we all remember Gyani Maya and her contribution to our knowledge of the Kusunda language and people. And unfortunately, what um, Kamala had expressed during the recordings became true. If you are gone, who, who will I have to talk to? And it's very difficult to imagine that you are the only person left in the world who speaks a language that is your mother tongue, that is the language that you grew up with. And um, uh, especially because there's no language which is even remotely related to Kusunda. So there's, there's no one who speaks even something similar to, to what Kamala speaks. And um, yeah, it, it also made me realize how timely our, our recordings actually were, because if we had waited just for another six months, we, had not, we would not have been able to record what we did. So at this moment, we still have Kamala as our language consultant, as the last speaker of Kusunda who can help us with this work. And we need to make maximum use of that advantage. And hopefully the corpus that we then produce can provide the basis for the subsequent analysis and description of Kusunda, but also for the revitalization efforts. Um, one important element of what I'm working on right now is to create an ELAN to flex workflow that will incorporate multiple participants, um, but also multiple orthographies, multiple translations. So multiple languages in which translations can be made, for, for example, English and Nepali, but also Devanagari orthography, IPA orthography, Latin orthography or Roman orthography, etc. cetera. Um, and the main objective is to enable local language consultants with limited software and computer skills to transcribe and translate recordings and check and adjust proposals for the parsing and glossing. And I think especially now with the pandemic, it has made us realize that um, also because of climate change, but mainly because of the pandemic, that travel is not always possible. Extended fieldwork periods may not always be feasible or possible. And from that extent, it's always good to have local language consultants who are able to um, work together on, 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 on um, de documenting and describing languages. Um, however, as many linguists here will be aware, Elan and Flex are 
complex software with rather steep learning curves that require quite a lot of insight and practice. And if they're not easy to use for trained field linguists at the MA or PhD level, then we can only imagine how it must be for community linguists um, who have much less formal training. And although SIL has developed Seymour as a user-friendly um, simple software that could also be used by community linguists, the main disadvantage is that it does not allow for multiple participants. So I've been working on this integrated approach where we can segment, transcribe and translate um, recordings in ELAN, then convert it to FLEX where it can be further um, annotated, um, interlinearized, and then convert it back to ELAN where um, the language consultants can check our analysis or the analysis and then subsequently um, um, suggest, make suggestions for corrections, etc. cetera. Um, I've actually submitted an article that describes this workflow. And um, once it is uh, reviewed, I will make the manual that I prepared on basis of um, my workflow, I'll make it available. So hopefully there will be other people who will be benefited as well. Um, for Kusunda, we aimed for an English translation aimed at the international audience, as well as a Nepali translation aimed at the audience in Nepal, the people, linguists, etc., in Nepal, but also the language developers who wanted to develop the Kusunda language. Um, there will be a phonetic transcription in IPA, so um, actually representing the speech of the individual speech act participants. And because both Gyanimaya and um, uh, Kamla spoke a different variety of Kusunda. We also looking for a phonemic transcription and this phonemic transcription in IPA will then be used for a Devanagari transcription in Kusunda, which can actually um, be used for revitalization for teaching purposes. Um, in addition, it's our aim to preserve the language consultant's original transcription, both in IPA and Devanagari, because this might um, give further indications or uh, tips or advice or um, something when we are later analyzing um, the uh, when we are analyzing the, um, the the text, the recordings. And I will now show you an example. So um, I hope everyone can see here a um, ELAN um, segment from an ELAN project file. And here we have the, um, the, 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 the recording, one of the recordings, the Kusunda recordings. And here we can use the play button. <laughs> So segment by segment, after segmentation, segment by segment, the, um, the, the, the transcriber can transcribe the recording um, in the IPA. He can add an English and Nepali translation, um, also a transcription in Devanagari, in Kusunda, in the Devanagari script. Um, and um, in this way, even if someone does not know English, for example, he can still give the translation in Nepali in the Devanagari script. Or if someone um, does not really know uh, IPA, he can just put triple X here um, and then um, give the, the transcription in, of Kusunda in the Devanagari script. And then later we can add the transcription in IPA based on the orthography that we have established for the language. So in that way, um, even people whose primary language is not English or who have very limited command of English will be able to still, if they are properly trained, use this to um, transcribe and translate um, texts. And we can then convert that to Flex and hopefully you will see the Flex interface here where in this analyze tab of the text and word session section, we can find the same segment, but now annotated. So broken up morphemes, um, words broken up in, in morphemes and then annotated, give parsed, glossed. Um, and the translations are down here, the English translation, the Nepali translation, the phonetic transcription and the community transcription, the, the, 
the transcription by the community linguist, both in the um, IPA and in the Devanagari scripts. And we can then again convert that to Elan. And here we can see that the same morpheme words, um, the, the different glosses and parses that we had made in flex are represented here. And on basis of this, the, the language consultant or the, the, the transcriber can have another look. He can play the sound file again. And then he can um, decide what, what what else um, should be added or deleted, whether there are any mistakes, changes, whether he agrees with the, um, he or she agrees with the, um, uh, the different morpheme glosses that we made, etc. And I will also show a small example of the annotation mode where we can here see the, um, the video and here we can find the various segments as well as their trans this transcription of the segments in the various scripts and the translation of the um, segments in the various scripts. And here we can play the video. And in this way, we can further annotate the recording. So that about the flex and Elan part. Um, now to proceed with the re revitalization efforts for Kusunda in the past two decades, enormous changes have taken place politically and socially in Nepal. I remember the first time when I came to Nepal, it was still the last Hindu kingdom in the world. This was followed by uh, the civil strife, by the Maoist insurgency, and um, then by the, um, uh, the, the ongoing political strife between different political parties and, and fractions within political parties, mostly involving around egos, it seems rather than about um, political ideals. But yeah, despite these continued struggles in Nepal, one of the major outcomes of this whole democratization process in Nepal has been the federal democratic structure in which more and more progressively more attention is being paid to the cultural and linguistic diversity of the nation. Um, and this is encouraging ethnic, cultural and linguistic consciousness among people who for a very long time were marginalized within this, um, within this Hindu based, caste based um, system, social structure of the country. And the constitution of Nepal itself is very clear in its recognition of the cultural and linguistic diversity of the people. And at least in theory, the government has given um, far reaching rights to the people, but also responsibilities of the state to secure these rights that have been enshrined within the constitution. And perhaps this makes Nepal one of the most progressive countries in South Asia in that respect. So in order to achieve some of these goals, especially as far as the linguistic um, part is concerned, the Nepal Language Commission was instituted and this commission has a national mandate. And till present, they have identified 133, 131 languages um, in Nepal. Um, so the commission has been supporting linguists, including community linguists in the documentation and description of these languages and the cultures of the people that speak them, which has resulted in surveys in grammatical descriptions, dictionaries, teaching materials and other outputs. And one of the languages in which the, for which the um, language commission has been supporting work is Kusunda. And the Nepal Language Commission has supported Uday to um, describe Kusunda to develop an orthography in the Devanagari script to prepare teaching materials and to actually teach the Kusunda language. Um, the first publication was a Kusunda Jati Rasabda Kos or the Kusunda Tribe and Dictionary, a 175 page book that did um, with an introduction in both English and Nepali and a Kusunda Nepali English vocabulary. Um, 
And if anyone is interested, I still have some copies um, which I can share on Uday's behalf. So please let me know afterwards. The second publication is the Kusunda Bhasako Itihas or History of the Kusunda Language, which is a 66 page book that details the available knowledge on the Kusunda history, culture and language, but this is only available in Nepali. Now, to get to the actual revitalization part, the revitalization of Kusunda is not so much something that we should, which was imposed by politicians or by linguists or by other, other external agents, but very much something we want expressed by the Kusunda community themselves. And this is, can also be seen in this wider process of increased ethnic and linguistic consciousness in Nepal, where the Kusunda people realize that their language, their, their, their culture, their, um, their origin, their, um, their uh, history, their feelings, their emotions, everything is expressed through their language. And once that it dawned onto them that their language was about to disappear, they very much um, felt the need to try to stem this process of Kusunda becoming um, extinct. Um, with the support of the Nepal Language Commission, then Uday started teaching Kusunda. And the first session was in February and March 2019, with a total of 20 students between 12 and 40 years old. 12 of them were school students, whereas eight were um, adults literate in Nepali. And these, ca these students came from the three districts with the highest ethnic Kusunda population. Um, the Nepal Language Commission provided a bu budget of two uh, 240,000 Nepal rupees, which is roughly equivalent to 1,500 um, British pounds. And in this first session, both Gyanimaya and um, Kamala were the teachers and Uday facilitated the classes. And as can be seen in this picture and the previous picture, the setup was very simple outside or in small huts. Um, students were, uh, had to sit on the floor and use was made, for example, of whiteboards. And this first session was kind of an introductory class. The students were introduced to the Kusunda language written in the Devanagari script. Um, they were taught um, basic Kusunda words and simple Kusunda sentences. Then the second session was supposed to be taught in early 2020. However, because of the spreading pandemic, this was postponed to the spring of 2021. And in that session, there were two separate groups, again, because of pandemic concerns, one with 13 children um, in the grades four to 10 taught by Uday and one with eight literate adults taught by Kamla. And although um, 10 of the students had actually attended the first session, 11 students um, were new. Um, and that was because it was not possible to gather all the students together because of the pandemic. However, when the Delta variant arrived to Nepal from India, the classes were um, unfortunately cut short. The topics of the second class session went a bit further than the first se session. It included parts of speech, it included different types of sentences, as well as an introduction to the possibility for creative writing. And the third session is planned for the coming winter. So this is the Kusunda um, textbook that Uday wrote based on uh, an example, which is used by the Nepal Language Commission to teach um, endangered languages of Nepal. And the Language Commission printed it and then it was distributed to students. And Uday is also trying to encourage students to use um, uh, Kusunda in, in social media, for example, in spoken voice messages, written voice messages, um, but also in creative writing, songs, poems, prose, etc. And like I said before, perhaps it would be possible to translate some existing children's books or to develop some new children's books. And of course, the main point would be that Kusunda people have to start speaking their language again. And, and um, because there are basically no adult speakers except for Kamla, except for one, it really depends on this group of, of, of students 
of these children and adults who are, who are learning the language to start using the language again in daily life, talk it to their grandparents, their parents, but especially to their children. And um, if they are able to use it, then there is still a good chance that, um, that the Kusunda has a future. Um, if they don't, then because of the whole situation, the future looks kind of bleak. So Kusunda is not really in an enviable position. There's only a single speaker left. And despite all the good um, intentions, also the wishes of the Kusunda people, um, there is still every chance that the language may become extinct in the next decade or so. However, the good thing is that neither the Kusunda people nor the Nepal government through the Nepal Language Commission are going to sit idle and let it happen. A lot of things are going on like these Kusunda classes, like the documentation projects um, that um, will hopefully enable the Kusunda people and their language uh, to have their language survive into the future. And hopefully this postdoc that I'm working on will also contribute to these goals. And of course, any help will be appreciated. So we are planning to make our um, transcribed and translated texts available in open access, preferably also if we can interlinearize them, we will interlinearize them, parsing them, glossing them, making them available for linguists, for academics, for researchers to work on and to contribute to the description of the Kusunda language. And we hope that, um, that it will not only remain limited to phonology or typology or grammatical features like the verbal paradigms um, or its phylogenetic status, but that people will also contribute um, um, in a positive way to um, enabling the revitalization efforts of the language. Um, there's one idea that has been floated for quite some time, which is to resettle um, the scattered community Kusunda communities in a contiguous area where they can then um, have access to forest resources, also be, be given access to housing, be given access to a, um, health and sanitation, to a school where they uh, can learn Kusunda as well as Nepali. Um, and, and this kind of a, a, a more clustered Kusunda settlement um, in order to not only um, contribute to, this, to, the, to the survival or the revitalization of the Kusunda language and culture, but also um, to uplift the socioeconomic status of all these scattered Kusunda communities or Kusunda families, basically. So that's all from my side. Um, I am uh, very much interested to have comments, suggestions from people, practitioners in the field, um, people who know about uh, Kusunda, the situation in Nepal, and who could um, uh, help us to, to forward this project. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we already have some questions in the chat, which uh, I'll read out. If you did write a question in the chat and want to participate, feel free to unmute yourself and engage when I get to your question or comment. Just a reminder, we are recording, so if you do participate, I assume you're giving consent to be uh, recorded and for that to be shared online. Uh, start with the question from Peter Austin. He's asking about whether there are any semi-speakers. Is there no one who has partial knowledge or has learned something of it as a second language? Because if there weren't, that would be very unusual from a global perspective. Thank you, Peter, for your question. Um, there are a few elderly people uh, like Prem Bahadur, maybe around five or six, who remember a little bit Kusunda. They can remember some words, but they are not able to make any um, consistent sentences. So the reason that, for example, Kamala still knows her language is because her mother, Puni Thakuri, was basically monolingual um, in Kusunda, and she lived with her mother, and she used to talk Kusunda with her mother till her mother passed away a few years ago. So she had that continued exposure to the language. Um, for most other Kusunda from a very young age onwards, they already started speaking in Nepali or in Kam or in um, Magar or some other Nepali language. And as a result, they, they lost um, their language quite rapidly, even if they spoke it as a child. Um, they didn't remember except for a few words. And that has been the situation for Kusunda 
for uh, the past decades, basically. And Gianni Maya, she still remembered her language quite well. And there are some people who say that the ones who stay in India, they may also still remember their language because there are supposed to be two or three people who left Nepal together to work in, uh, and if I remember correctly, it was Bhopal in India. And because they stayed together, they could still um, uh, speak to each other in, in the Kusunda language. So the main problem has been that even if people grew up or, or, or were born and learned Kusunda when they were young, when they grew up, when they became teenagers, as soon as they married outside of the Kusunda family and they start living with people who spoke in Nepali or another language, they just lost Kusunda. And they had no one to talk to in Kusunda. And as a result of that, the language basically disappeared very rapidly. So for the, at the moment, I don't, there are a few people who know a little bit Kusunda, but I would not really want to call them semi-speakers because their um, their knowledge is so limited that that it 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 does not actually qualify as a semi-speaker. Uh, Peter also uh, references a uh, an article on this topic of of last speaker in the uh, chat, which uh, I can send you later to make sure you can okay. follow up on that. Okay, I'll sure. jump to a question though from Vijay D'Souza. It says thanks for the talk, amazing work. How did you approach segmentation in Elon, and specifically in terms of training community linguists to recognize meaningful chunks? Uh, that's a very um, that's a very tricky um, tricky uh, approach, and that's still something that I'm to be honest that I have to work on. And um, for now, the the main uh, segmentation. So Uday uh, has been working um, uh, on the segmentation himself. So he made the sentences himself and um, I have made the segmentation in Elan again based on, on his or earlier segmentation. So there has been some um, uh, adjustment here and there because um, indeed it is very difficult even for trained linguists to um, determine whether you should segment at phrases or whether it should be longer sentences and where to make those segment breaks. And I I have to be honest, I don't think there is a kind of a, um, uh, a one fits all um, um, recipe in how to do that. And um, uh, I think that, that it, it's part also intuition. And um, if someone knows the language well enough, I think for them it's easier to actually make the segmentation than for people who do not, um, who are not speakers themselves or who do not know or understand the language uh, well enough yet so it's it's um it's a, it's a very good issue and it is um something that i will also look in more um when 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 like in the in the manual the segmentation part it is basically presumed as something uh, autonomous something that is being done but it is indeed something that could be looked into in more detail there were a few uh, comments and questions related to conversational data. Uh, so Julia Salabank mentions that she was very pleased to see a focus on conversational data. And uh, Peter again had some questions uh, about the use and the analysis of that data. So uh, he wrote, since you recorded conversation, have you adopted any aspects of a conversational analysis approach? Um, your examples, and I think here he's referring to the, the Elan um, annotations, don't tell us anything about interactional speech. And then he also made a comment wondering about um, the use of this conversational data in the uh, language revitalization. So is there, it seems like from what you presented that there's a focus on literacy and less on a use of this conversational and interactional language that, that people in recent literature, including some work that he's done with Julia, have pointed out that this conversational stuff may be more important for revitalization than literacy. So. What have you can say about you know what you've done in terms of conversational analysis, and two, then how have you incorporated that into the revitalization efforts? Um, thank you for your uh, comments. Yeah, um, here I have to say that this is still very much at the um, uh, uh, inception phase. So we have made those recordings in two thousand nineteen, 
And now we are working on the um, transcription, translation, and analysis. And that is still an ongoing process. And indeed, it is difficult to actually, if you have multiple participants in a conversation um, with overlapping speech, it is sometimes quite difficult to properly um, uh, segment and annotate that in ELAN. Um, and um, what we try to do right now is in our transcription, make sure that everything is being transcribed in the in uh, including um including the the pauses the stills etc um but also make sure that markers that 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 have not been described before are properly um transcribed so that that they can be analyzed later on and that is the good the, the, that is the advantage of having the video there as well and the fact that you can actually play the video or play the recording and at the same time make the, um, the, the transcription, that you can also see how people interact with each other in nonverbal communication. And um, this, is, um, this is still ongoing. And um, we have finished now maybe uh, 23 minutes of recording out of the total of two hours are now finished in transcription and translation, but out of these only maybe around three or four minutes have been completely annotated. So it is still very much something, um, uh, something ongoing, um, which has not been completed. And we have not looked at, at, at how to um, incorporate different aspects of conversational analysis um, into, into, our, um, into our actual annotation, et cetera. And the second question was about the yeah, just how how does or how maybe in the future do you think you might incorporate some of this conversational data into the revitalization efforts? Yeah, um, at the moment, people who don't know any Kusunda have to learn Kusunda. So at the moment, it is very much about teaching them vocabulary, teaching them simple sentences. Um, and Kusunda is quite, uh, it's a pronominalizing language. It's quite complex in that way. It is not something that people who know Nepali or people who know Magar or people who know um, uh, Kam or another language are, are very familiar with. So for, for, from that aspect, right now, the basis is very much on, um, on teaching the basics. And once these students have the basics um, and, and then the conversational part will come in, in which they actually have to talk to each other. So right now they are just asking each other, "How are you? What did you eat today?" and things like that. And it is it is a very slow process, also because many of these are students in schools, so they don't have um, 365 days a year in which they can be taught Kusunda. It is just a matter of um, one month, maybe every winter, every year. And because of the pandemic, even that hasn't been possible. So it's, 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 a, very, it's a very small attempt that is being made at the moment. And you definitely, you're right. If you want to teach people to a language so they use it in daily life again, all these conversational aspects are extremely important. And um, we hope that that is also why we will make our data available for people to look at it from different perspectives, people who are more expert in certain um, uh, parts of uh, certain linguistic topics will be able to help us to analyze it from a different perspective and come up with advice on, on for example, how to teach as well. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, if anybody else has a question or comment, feel free to use the raise hand function or is mentioned in the chat that you'd like to ask a question or uh, write out your question in the chat. Um, got a question here. Uh, I think it's from Jack, although the name doesn't show completely. He says, thank you for the talk. I'm curious about the Kasunda community's attitude toward the revitalization of the language. Are they generally proactive? Are they aware of how being able to speak the language is linked to some aspects of their self identities? So yeah, what what's been the attitudes and and mm -hmm. motivations from from the Kasunda side? Well, the Kusunda themselves, they they and that was the first thing that basically Uday told me. They want they don't want to see their language disappear. They now know that their language is about to disappear, and they 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 feel sad about that because they realize that that it is. Uh, that their whole culture and and their their history is basically encapsulated within that language, 
and and they are very um, supportive of any attempt or any any activity that promotes their language, like the Kusunda Welfare um, Society in Nepal has been supporting any kind of, of project which aims at, um, at, at, at describing, documenting, describing and revitalizing Kusunda. So it's, um, it's very much something which comes from within the Kusunda community as well. And I think they, they are a little bit aware of the um, difficulties that, that are inherent to the fact that you try to revitalize a language which is now only spoken by one person, but that does not really um, withhold them from, from not supporting any attempts. And they can't learn it all because I mean, that, that was someone recently also asked me like, okay, these um, students, they are paid 100 Nepal rupees per day. So are you sure that they are not just participating because they are getting paid for it? And I was like, okay, but you have to understand that also from a Nepali perspective in, in the winter holiday, um, when students are at home, they're supposed to work together with their parents or they're being sent for some day labor or whatever. Um, so there has to be some kind of a, a, an incentive for, for people to participate as well. And they don't participate plainly for the money. They're very clear about that. They're very enthusiastic um, in, in wanting to learn their language. And they understand that, especially the younger ones, but also the adults, they understand that, that the future of their language basically now depends on them and their participation and their um, involvement and and, and their continued involvement and their ability to um, revitalize the language and, and pass it on to the next generation. Great, thanks. Are there any other uh, final questions or comments? Otherwise I can follow up with one more question um, from Peter Austin's comments. He also commented on uh, language revitalization programs, I believe one in Poland that's focused on teenagers rather than adults or children, and on programs in Australia that are focusing on incorporating semi-speakers into the revitalization. I wonder what you've seen from the dynamics of this community. You know, have you focused on different age groups or different groups in terms of their understanding of the or, or how they remember the language and culture? Do you see different levels of engagement or, or ways to sort of leverage some, some people's enthusiasm to help others or how might different uh, groups within the Kusunda help each other in this you know, revitalization process? Yeah, again, it's, 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 um, it's a bit of a different situation from many other language communities because there are basically no semi-speakers and um, uh, you basically start from scratch in that only Kamla now is there to teach her language. She is the only one who remembers her language and all the other Kusunda people don't know the language and you have to start from nothing. It's basically trying to revive an extinct language rather than revitalize a dying language. Um, and, and from that perspective, the approaches that that are taken may be a little bit different from what you experience or see uh, elsewhere. Um, the age range of the participants in the Kusunda classes is actually quite broad. Um, it is, uh, the eldest was I think 14, 40 and the youngest is 12. So they are like adults as well as, um, as, as, as children, school going children and, um, and um, they have been taught sometimes together, but in the last session, they were all also split up between um, the adults and the children. That was actually mainly because of pandemic concerns, but on the other hand, also it kind of um, facilitated the teaching process because the approach that you can take to adults and to children was different. So Uday was the one to teach the children, which was very much focused on teaching them not just how to speak, but also how to read and write. So there, there was the, the, the focus on writing Kusunda in Devanagari and the textbook also includes writing exercises, not just speaking. Whereas Kamla's session with the eight adults was much more about speaking. How do you say this? How do you say this? So trying to get adults to interact with each other in the Kusunda language. So there are these different approaches that are being taken and being tried out. And 
there are only around 150 Kusunda people in Nepal and the majority of them are too busy in trying to survive on a daily basis to be actually involved in attending classes for one month. Um, and, and that is where this idea of having this settled Kusunda community comes in, where the Kusunda can actually live together. Um, the families that are now scattered in different parts of Nepal can live together, they can have access to forest resources, they can have agricultural land, they have uh, a school where Kusunda is taught, etc. So that idea has been floating around, but in, in practicality, of course, it's, it's not an easy thing to achieve. But for the, in the case of Kusunda, uh, Uday and myself, when we were discussing, we were saying like, okay, maybe this is really a good approach because then you have people together and they can interact with each other. And in that way, it's much easier to, um, to revitalize the language than that students come to, to learn Kusunda um, for one month and then are expected to go back to their family, which lives very in a very remote place from any other Kusunda family. And then they are supposed to teach Kusunda to their own family and come back again the next, the next year. That, that is a bit a difficult approach, I think. So that's why that idea of a Kusunda settlement came up. But for the time being, that's not really materialized right yet. So. Okay, we are we are running out of time, but I did think of one more question I wanted to ask since you just uh, used these words. And I, I was wondering if you've had any reaction from Kusunda people about metaphors of death and extinction in terms of you know their the situation of their language or even of framing uh, Kamala as the last speaker. Is that language that's been used around Kusunda speakers? Are they comfortable with it? Do you have any interactions with those kinds of metaphors? Mm. There have been several reports in the Nepali um, media, for example, last speaker of Kusunda has died, last speaker of Kusunda has died, there are no more Kusunda. And because of that, um, Kamla, for example, is very much aware that she is now the last Kusunda speaker. And she was very happy when she was introduced by David Waters and his team, when she was introduced to Gyani Maya, for example, because she had someone to talk to in um, Kusunda after her, her mother, Puni Thakuri, passed away. So at that time, when we interviewed the two of them, when we made the recordings to, of the two of them together, you could see that they were still very, um, uh, they were happy for not being the last. And you can notice that Kamla now, she is kind of, it's good that she speaks Nepali and that, that, she, that she has her family, et cetera, to support her and that she meets with other Kusunda people, even though they don't speak um, her language. Um, but um, yeah, you can see that, that it, it, it's kind of, she's proud in a way, but she is also quite sad because of the situation that, that she is in. And um, yeah, that's, that's why we hope that, that teaching Kusunda to um, other Kusunda people will, will, will give her, it, it, that's why she's participating as well, because she has this hope that it will lead to a situation where she won't be the last anymore and, and the language won't die with her. So uh, have you had any interact or any reactions to the metaphors of language death or extinction? In Kusunda, there's not really, they don't really speak about it in, in that way. They don't, they don't, um, they don't express it in, 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 such, in such ways. We haven't really heard them use like it will die, but just there won't be anyone for me to talk to anymore. That is how, how she basically expresses the, the, the fear of the future situation. Okay. Good. Well, I think our hour is up, so we'll stop there, Tim. I'll send you all of the, uh, the text from the chat so you can follow up with any other questions or comments or references there. So but once again, thank you to uh, Tim and thank you everyone for participating. Okay, thank you very much everyone for attending. Thank you, Joey, for organizing.